Honor. It's uh, a great privilege of me for me to introduce our second speaker. Uh, Peter Ubel was once on the faculty of the University of Michigan, a fact about which we were all very happy. Uh, and then he became the Madge and Dennis T. McClawhorn University Professor of Business Policy and Medicine at Duke University. Well, I think it would have been easier if they just named the departments you weren't in. Um, uh, Peter is both a physician and a behavioral scientist. He's published not only in the top journals in his field, but he's written books that have uh, sort of infiltrated pop culture. And so he's really able to speak to very different types of audiences. Today, he's going to talk to us about ways to help patients make great decisions. Thank you for being here. I've written books that were supposed to have had pop culture Im uh, impact, but. Um, since I'm at ISR, I should start off with a survey. How many people think it's too early in the day to talk about sex? Anyone? <laughs> Ken. OK, Ken. Yeah. Well, oh, well, well, 10 AM. 10 AM for Ken. Um, yeah, so I'll get to sex in a bit. Um, so I want to set up the context of, of the kind of risk and benefit communication that I've focused a lot of my research on which has been in clinical contexts where the right medical choice is not just about medical facts, but depends upon value judgments about what a particular patient cares about. So the example I'll give you is one of a man with early stage prostate cancer, very slow growing cancer, unlikely to end his life, but one, and therefore one that you can kind of watch, but watch pretty actively, like every six months come in and get some more testing, occasionally might even get more biopsies of the prostate, a lot of anxiety, wondering if the cancer spread at that time or not, and then you can do aggressive treatment if there's a sign that it's growing. Or you can just get rid of the cancer right off the bat with surgery or radiation, and then there's a decent chance that you will have a hard time controlling your bladder and a hard time having a normal erection. That's the sex part of the talk. Um, all else equal would seem that men more interested in having a, a robust sex life would be less likely to aggressively treat the cancer as long as their values are part of the decision. And so I've done a bunch of work with colleagues like Angie Fagerlin and Brian Zickman Fisher, where we try to help patients understand the pros and cons of some treatment decision they face so that they can then have a role in the decision. And part of that is very basic, how do you communicate the risks? Like what is the chance of bladder dysfunction if you have surgery? What is the chance of erectile dysfunction? What is the chance of survival with and without this or that intervention? And so we've done a lot of work that you could think is very cognitive, very heavy about reasoning and, and information exchange. Um, and I'm going to show you just a couple of lessons we've learned from our research, but I also uh, subscribe to the idea that this is not just about reasoning and cognition. A lot of it's about I mean, people call about, talk about risk as feelings, that a lot of the way that these things impact people's, the way they look at risks and benefits is very rapid and fast, maybe affect-laden. Um, and so there's going to be a little gamish of cognition and affect or fast and slow thinking. And then I'm going to add at the end a quick bit of context of the ultimate way these decisions are made, which is in, in the social context often of a clinical appointment where everything really gets mucked up. So. Um, one of the things that is important in, ignore the picture, that should come up later, but one of the things, a pretty basic thing, okay, so one of the contexts to help people make these decisions is to put together a decision aid, maybe some kind of almost an educational brochure on steroids that helps a patient understand the risks and benefits of their treatment choices. Uh, something that often uh, leading medical societies do at about a 12th grade reading level. So lesson number one, use plain language, how about seventh grade or less? Pretty basic and important thing. But, but it, it works not only in the level of people understanding the risk, but the ease with which you understand something affects the way that risk information feels. And so you want information, I think, to, be, to feel less hard to comprehend. That um, it's important to give absolute risk information, to say that, someone ha uh, that if you take this pill, it will reduce your ch chance of breast cancer coming back by 50% is misleading when your risk of recurrence is 6% and it cuts it to 3%. And so, and you'll see often the pharmaceutical industry will emphasize relative risk, the 50% risk reduction, and hope you don't pay attention to your absolute risk, which is already so small that the risk reduction isn't that important. This is the pictograph that um, I, I'm, uh, 
is important. It's one way to help people understand probabilistic information because most Americans, many Americans aren't very good. Like a third of Americans don't understand probability and the other half don't know how to add fractions, right? <laughs> and so, um, and, and one of the things that's important then is if you can give people a picture to understand the risk, um, it gives it, it makes it easier for them. It's actually faster, it's more concrete. It raises the problem, of course, of whether you should have getting to a different denominator problem. Should you show a picture of a thousand or a hundred? Um, turns out those feel very different to people. Um, but, um, and, there, and so we've done a bunch of research to figure out how to get rid of that problem. Um, so frequencies are, more, are easier for people to understand than probabilities. Um, when many people have made decision aids, they've tried to show people the risks, say the side effects of a treatment. This is on the left shows that it, this is about a pill tamoxifen that it can be used to prevent a breast cancer recurrence. Or if you're at high enough risk for breast cancer, it can prevent you from getting that first breast cancer. But it has side effects, one of which is um, the risk of cataracts. And on the left, you see the risk of cataracts, just base, baseline risk. And on the right, you see the risk if you take tamoxifen. This is a common way that people were designing decision aids, trying to inform people about it. But it actually forces the person to do the math, to realize that most of that risk on the right was already present on the left. Um, and so when you show people the risk, the baseline risk, and then show them the incremental risk, the risk feels very different. It changes. It actually got rid of the denominator effect of whether we showed 100 squares or 1,000 went away once we did the math for people. And so it's, there's important ways to kind of improve how people understand this and doing the math for them, making it easy. I mean, what comes pretty naturally and easy to many of us in the room not, does not come easy to many people in the general public, especially when they're in the setting of something scary like a health problem, a medical diagnosis. Um, in trying to give people information about the risks and benefits of treatment, we have to worry that they'll feel differently about that than if we give them the risks, I'm sorry, give them the benefits followed by the risks. And so it's really hard to be very neutral in trying to give people information. And so one of the things that I advocate is experimentation to find out whether the order with which you present information shapes how people feel about it and think about it, and if there are ways to overcome those kinds of order effects. One way to overcome them is to use summary tables when you're done. So you have to give people information in some order. Um, and that can certainly set people off where the most recent thing sticks in their mind and has the strongest impact or not. But sometimes then have a summary table that puts together the information. It brings everything becomes more recent. Um, not always simple. Um, just did a study where we found if you put calorie information on the left of a menu, 20% fewer calories than if you put calorie information on the right of a menu. So even things that are right there on one menu you have to read them in some order, so it's, it's not an easy problem to solve. Um, when we were developing decision aid for women with, with, uh, at risk for, high, for breast cancer, and we told them what their risk was and what it would be if they took this pill, they said that's fine and dandy and I understand all the information, but what's the average woman's risk? They wanted to know whether their risk was above or below average. And we found that that has strongly influences how people respond, how they feel about that risk. The same risk feels very different if you're told it's above or below average. And that feel changes the kind of actions you want to take in response to the risk. Um, and so I, I don't find that very helpful normatively, and, but it's a challenge to recognize. Uh, and then basically we want to emphasize critical information when we're helping patients understand these choices. And you definitely want to draw attention to the time interval. When do these risks happen? How much time do you have to make the decisions? Things like that. Because patients often feel very hurried to get to the end and make a decision. So that's the context. So the context is there's, if you're giving people information to help them make a medical decision, there are better and worse ways of doing it. There's no perfect way. And you need experimentation to help uh, refine those methods. But then what happens is um, they go in and they see, say, a, a physician. And in one of the studies that uh, we did, Angie Fagel and Ledit, we gave everybody a seventh grade level decision aid that had every one of these techniques built into it. We gave that to them before they saw their doctor, before they even knew they had prostate cancer, uh, in case they were going to get that diagnosis after a biopsy. And then we audio recorded what happened when they met with their doctor. We found, by the way, um, we found that people had much more knowledge about their treatment alternatives after reading this decision aid. I have no idea if I bumped into something. Um, 
And uh, so they had the decision aid worked to help inform people about the risks and benefits. Then they saw their doctor. Now, before they saw the doctor, we said, if you have prostate cancer, what's your leaning? And some of the people said, I want that thing where they just surveil it. There's just surveillance, nothing more than that. So at the bottom, people wanted surgery or radiation. In the middle, people were like, yeah, I could go either way. I need to hear more. But their baseline preference had nothing to do with what treatment they got. And there's another picture of that same result. So what I came in, my leaning, and you'd think the people at the beginning who said, I want that surveillance thing, it might be because they still wanted to be able to make love to their partner. But by the end of the clinic appointment, that had no impact on the decision they got. It's because it ended up being dominated by what the physician recommended. And the physician recommendations were based almost entirely on how old the patient was and if the cancer was really early or kind of early. Um, it had almost nothing to do with a conversation about whether the man cared about being able to have erections or how anxious that person was about living with a cancer inside his body. Um, the docs come right out and say, it means we shouldn't sit tight on this because it can cause problems later in your life. It came out like a medical fact, even though it incorporated an enormous value judgment. We had one patient where the doc said, look, you're young, you got to get this out. And the patient says, but doc, I'm retiring in three years. I can't afford to leave work and have one of these major treatments. Can we at least wait three years? Oh, well, sure, in that case, sure. But there was no discussion prior to that of other things that might be relevant to deciding whether this guy should have the treatment, uh, aggressive treatment or not. Um, also, what's important is that um, doctors are biased. And many of these doctors, or some of them in our study, came right out and said, look, I'm a surgeon. I'm biased in favor of surgery. But, so let me tell you about surgery. And then let me tell you about radiation. But again, I'm a surgeon. I like surgery. That's a good way to help people recognize that they're getting biased advice. Yet those patients were more likely to have surgery. Um, and the issue was, this is how much more likely they were to have surgery, by the way. And when we did a lab experiment to look at why this happened, it's because in half the people in this got a video of a doctor admitting a bias and half the doctor didn't admit the bias, but they all described the surgery. They thought the doctor was more biased when he admitted being biased. They, however, also trusted the doctor more, would be more likely to recommend that doctor to a friend. And so it kind of undermined what went on. And it's that trust that ended up predicting that they were more likely to take the doctor's advice. So that was just the, I wanted to put that into that context. So medical decisions involving risk and benefit are cognitive and affective. Um, these tie together very closely, and they're also very social, and we have to understand that. Thanks. All right, uh, we'll run a Q&A session. We'll run it till about uh, 17 after. Uh, we'll take, so one, if you can raise your hands, and then we'll have uh, some of the staff with the microphones come around. Uh, David, we'll give you the first question. Thank you. So I'm sympathetic to everything you said, but I, I was a little worried about your emphasis on absolute versus relative risk because I think they should be both communicated. And you know, if you ignore cost, as you did in, in your description, you may create the impression that it's okay to violate monotonicity or probability, everything else being equal, because you know, six percent, three percent are close enough. But uh, so uh, we. I think you should, take, you should give precedence to relative risk, but it, oh, I'm sorry, to, uh, to absolute risk, but it always has to be in the context of what's the difference in cost or benefits if you choose one over the other. That's um, may have to debate that with you at some point. I, I think that, well, pro good news is nobody understands the probabilities anyway. Um, I mean, that's a bit of a problem. And so, but it makes me worried that if I, I start saying, Look, this is going to cut your risk in half. Absolutely. Now, but that's from 1% to 0.5%. I'm, I'm worried that half, that half feels very big or something that doubles your risk. I would never want to take a, risk, a pill that doubled my risk of something. And it could double the risk of one thing and cut another risk in half. And if I don't know the absolute values, I don't know what to make but of it. Do you, do you disagree that normatively, if there's no evidence that it costs more it has, or it has higher risk, even though the difference, the absolute yeah. difference is small, you should take, you know, the 50% increase. So are you, are you asking about something where there's no real trade-off involved? Yes. Yeah. Well, 
Yeah, I mean, so when there's no trade-off involved, I think um, we could ask whether it matters, right? And then maybe, should we be more in persuasion mode than in neutral information giving mode or not? But I'm, I was really focusing on decisions, which to me mean if there's pros and cons to something. And, I, and in weighing off those trade-offs, I think that relative risk increase and reduction can be very uh, emotionally charged and misleading. But yeah. So, and just a quick follow-up. I think from my experience with people who've been through various difficult medical issues, sometimes the trade-offs that they really are on people's mind are not the kind of trade-off that physicians are aware of. In particular, in the United States, there are the issues of insurance coverage and, insur and accessibility. And I think that one of the reasons you mentioned in passing that people are fe uh, feel that they are being rushed into making medical decisions is because they know they had to wait six months to get that first appointment. And I think that if they don't make the decision quickly, right there on the spot, it may be too late by the time they make up their mind and have uh, another opportunity. And I think that's something that's somehow missing from this analysis, things that are very, very practical and local, but really affect patients to a large degree. I agree. There's a lot of things missing from this analysis. Sorry. Okay, uh, we have a question uh, from the center. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm Herschel Eccles from Dartmouth. I also go by center row three. Um, <laughs> so uh, Peter, this was great. Uh, and I have a question about some of what you were talking about at the end about when you gave these decision aids to clinicians. Um, so my broader question is just what institutional sites you think are the most likely sources of adoption and sort of efficacious use of these kinds of decision aids, whether you think it's clinicians, insurers, providers, or some agency or, or regulatory solution to go back to our last conversation. Um, I don't know if there's evidence on this front or you just have sort of uh, your own opinions, but um, I'd be curious to hear them. Um, they're not being, decision aids are not being heavily adopted many places, and the people who put energy into adopting them do them for, because it promotes the financial bottom line. Mm -hmm. So when I was trying to talk to a cardiology group about implementing a decision aid to decide about getting an angioplasty, they worried it would reduce how many patients would want an angioplasty and they weren't so interested. If I went to the insurance company, they might be more interested. So, and then it becomes a problem then of who, you know, what's the real motive here? Is it to promote what's best for the patient or, or for some other interest group? So maybe you just have the clinicians promote the decision aids that it get, increase their business, and the insurance companies the ones, and then everybody gets them. I don't know. Uh, the next question is from Professor Dan Kahan. Okay, so um, I mean, I guess this has to do, or kind of an elaboration of what you're one of the themes of kind of the futility of probability. Um, that I mean, I know you're saying people aren't very numerate, um, but. The real pro the problem isn't even that they're not numerate; it's that they don't value their system of valuation isn't connected to numbers, yeah. right? So we all know that you know Gigenrens are at this point with the franchise teach you know probability teach uh, conditional probability in half an hour. It started with anybody, you know, it went to like you know third graders <coughs> to intelligence analysts to dogs and so forth and so on. But when you teach a patient a medical patient, the conditional probability in 30 minutes, they know how to do conditional probability, but they don't know how to make a decision because the um, information you've now taught them to extract still doesn't connect up to their values. They haven't been thinking that way their whole life. And so, like what, this is a part substantive research program question and part, I guess, like a training practice question, but, um, what's the research program to try to figure out how to make the information that's in the numbers, because that's where it is, commensurable with the values of the patient, especially given that there's so much heterogeneity in that across people, in part because of numeracy and in part because of reasoning styles even among people who are numerate. And then what's the way to um, train physicians to use that information um, to use the information we have now as good as it is, but also in the future as it becomes even better. What do you mean how numbers can be made commensurable so, with patients' well, values? Well, so like you can, you can, they, you might be able to teach them like with the, um, with the kind of diagram you have right. about, and, and you, as you pointed out, even like there are gonna be ratio bias effect, but, but even, 
even once you're convinced that they've got the right answer numerically, it's not clear that that informs their decision because the way that they've been making decisions right. is not one that's extracted it from numbers. Yeah. Alan Peters' work tells yeah. us that highly numerate people, they extract kind of like information of normative significance from numbers. Low numerate people don't, yeah. and making them numerate doesn't help. Yeah. And so part of like the challenge for being for medical practice is, well, this isn't a person who doesn't have valuation, it's just that um, there's got to be some kind of exchange rate or translation, I, I guess, you know, to, to, so that the information that actually is relevant in the numbers is put into the currency of evaluation that helps them. That's a really wicked research problem, but it's also got to be a wicked practice problem because it's going to involve a kind of, um, you know, capacity facility of, of counseling, I think. I'm just curious yeah, no, yeah. about that. No, I think it's huge. I mean, so you've got somebody who is faced with a brand new, say, diagnosis that's already overwhelming, and now you're asking them to be a mathematical decision maker when that's probably not how they make most decisions in their lives, and that's that's a terrible collision of, of, of challenges. Um, and so one option is what most doctors have done through most history is you don't really do much with the numbers and you kind of guide them in what to do and that that's got problems um, and so I think what you do I think at some point you want to make the numbers as unscary and as familiar as possible and so a picture then just say so of a hundred men like you uh, who went through the surgery five of them are going to have some real leaking of their bladder afterwards and there's five dots and that's mathematical but it's really just showing that it's not most men who get the surgery. Um, and then you're, and you're interpreting it with other language. Now, that's, that's risky too. Even how you interpret it um, is, is a challenge. Um, it's hard to be neutral. Um, and so what I, what I, with my emphasize, when I work with clinicians, I mainly want them to give information in a way that at least people get some sense of it and then those who really can grab hold of it can assert themselves, which is sometimes a minority. And then if they can do the job of trying to understand what the patient cares about, they can do more of the math of putting together the numbers and the values. And so that's, when I work with physicians, it's trying to get them to diagnose preferences. Yeah. And um, they're not good at that. Is there a research program though associated with that, diagnosing preferences, so that you actually you know, make that as exacting and reliable and valid as it can be, or is that just gut? It is, it is a, a stuttering research program that's very, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question will come from uh, Professor Adam Berinsky. <clears throat> Thanks. I, I thought this paper was really interesting. Um, but I have a question about the communication of information. So I'll start with a very quick story. Uh, when my wife was pregnant with our son, we had an early stage screening done. And we got a bad number out. It's like so, you know, one in three chance of a problem. You know, took us to a genetic counselor, and in talking to the genetic counselor, it was pretty clear to me that she had no knowledge of probability. Right? So I asked her, you know, what's genetic counselor? Yeah. So I said, like, what's the base rate? And she said, what? And I said, well, you wouldn't tell me that there's a zero percent chance of a problem, like based on maternal age and this and then. You know, so after a half hour conversation, like, it became clear that the base rate was one in twenty, and so one in three, not quite as scary. Um, so, you know, this paper is all about communicating from the doctor to the patient, assuming that the doctor understands. So I'm, you know, I'm willing to, to concede that this is probably not the best trained genetic counselor, right? And then there are other, good, and I know genetic counselors in Boston who are very good. Um, but there's a lot of heterogeneity in, in kind of knowledge and thinking about the communicate, this is really a two-step communication process where an authority communicates knowledge to a doctor, the doctor communicates to the patient. This is focused on sort of assuming away that first part of the problem and right, conceding that this is the case I described as probably somewhat anomalous, but right, it's not completely anomalous. So I'm wondering, in, in your research, have you thought about this kind of two-stage flow of information, you, you know, you can go back to like a third stage, like how do we decide that these, you know, how do we generate these probabilities in the first place? So just kind of wondering, you now this is actually, this is a question question as opposed to, uh, you know, sort of a directed uh, statement posing as a question. I'm just kind of curious, like to what extent you've thought about this 
in your research and kind of moving I forward? Just to answer a different question, because I'm really struck that you, a sophisticated, and you're, you know, you come in and you clearly understand math or probabilistic reasoning better than the genetic council you worked with, but the one in 20 was really helpful to you in understanding the one in three, which is fascinating because I thought one in three was pretty easy to understand. And so what, one of the things that's really interesting is how different one in three feels depending on that contextual information. And I don't know that normatively, rationally speaking, it, it should affect, like, well, if, if a risk is one in three of something and an amniocentesis will clarify that risk, help you make a decision and have this risk get to the fetus, et cetera, one in three is one in three is one in three. I don't care if it ch changed from one in a million or one in 20, it got to one in three. But it, it does feel very different, and that to me, that's kind of a general theme of what, that I'm very interested in, is how do you, it's the, di the difference between understanding risk and what that risk feels like and how it motivates. I think it's also it's a, me understanding the difference between a screener and a test, which yeah. the counselor didn't really seem to understand either, yeah. right? Which was a big problem. So like, if you're telling me that this is a screener and the base rate is one in 20, going to one in three, you know, so I'm, we still freaked out, right? But we didn't freak out as much. I mean, it's like the, yeah. you know, between that and the amnio, like that was like the worst two weeks of our life. But it wasn't, it wasn't that in terms of thinking about it, but it was just very clear that the authority figure that we were talking to didn't have the, the ability to communicate what, what she, you know, so like she's yeah. giving us pamphlets about abortion, it's like, you know, it's like, this is, right, so that's a bad case. But I think it, the, no, the general good. problem though, yeah is, you know, doctors are people too who have problems with numbers as well. And so sort of, I'm just sort of fascinated as someone who studies communication, like it's kind of like a telephone game, right? That you get the initial communication, it goes through someone, I give the extreme example, but you can think of less extreme examples. They communicate it, the patient hears something else, they make their decision. So I guess that I, I just kind of pushing you again to kind of think about this as this multi-chain yeah multi-level chain of communication of information. Yeah, and I, and I think that's incredibly important. And uh, I, I think doctors are often really bad with this stuff. You, they really care about five-year survival rates from cancers. But if you just find cancers that never would have done any harm, they'll live five years. And your survival rate's up. Doesn't mean it was good to find it, right? So doctors, their reasoning isn't always that great. The challenge is, you know, so that means you want some kind of more neutral, really well-designed information milieu that's out there for people to get to that will make up for the deficits of the people they're interacting with. And, and then the problem is we also have to get them to not then listen this closely to the people they interact with, right? And so when we had this, I think, total failure of our decision aid to help prostate cancer patients, our follow-up study was we made a DVD reenacting some of these encounters and to try to teach patients when their doctors might be going off the rails. Politely, you know, but where they have to almost come in as a little bit more sophisticated. Okay. Uh, the next question will come from Professor Sarah Gallist. Professor Gallist. <laughs> um, I think my question has actually been related to a bunch of these um, pediatricians again on that negative space where there aren't decision aids. On the one hand, like why? For what? For what conditions are there no decision aids? No one's interested in making them. It gets to the denominator question. Like for what types of medical decisions do we not feel that? this intensity of decision making is required and what explains that. Um, and I think my other question also related to the production of the statistics that enter decision aids is how, it, how, how, how narrow do the statistics have to be sort of when we think about group differences and, and disparities and think, overlaying an equity conversation here when you're talking to someone who may, um, who, who may belong to a group that suffers from a higher risk of an illness, and how does that information get communicated um, when you're down to this medical decision-making context? So can you elaborate on that last part? More. Well, I mean, w when you're showing a, a decision aid that your research group creates or that is created by a professional society with all the biases, for what type of patient, how, yeah. how narrow does it become? How specific? Uh, how specific. tailored, individually how tailored, tailored. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so first, I, don't, I think decision aids are gr fine and great and everything, and they're just such a small part of trying to make this happen better. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a great business case for them yet, mm -hmm. for most, and um, you don't, and, and since there's not a reimbursement model for them, that's been a big sure. barrier. And, um, 
And then there's, they get really complicated because once you make one, you have to, then how specific and accurate does the information have to be? And how much does the decision aid have to be revised? How frequently when new information comes in? So I think that's been a big barrier. I think the places where this is happening best right now are when they're getting to the genetics of things like, and you're seeing it mainly in cancer now, where you're getting, you, you have a tumor removed and then they run the genes on it and now they actually tailor your, S, you know, your chance of benefiting from chemo, uh, your chance of recurrence, it becomes tailored to the genetic level. And the comp there are companies that are doing the gene testing that mm -hmm. now, what's really neat is they're looking at some of this research and trying to give people better understanding of that. But outside of that <coughs> lucrative market for mm -hmm. genetic testing, it's not huge. Uh, the next question will come from uh, Professor Bishop as well. So Peter, that was good. I want to build on uh, what Dan and Sarah said and just offer a comment and see what you think. So we overemphasize decision aids, somehow thinking that there is this rational process through which people go through in making decisions and we know um, preferences and values and other issues matter of context, right? So. Um, I'm thinking of a different problem than treatment, say decisions around end of life mm -hmm. conversations, right? The easy now, stuff. And, and those are particularly challenging. So what we found, uh, for example, if you, uh, in those conversations, um, say between African American families versus if you are doing it with families with, uh, who are white, uh, and that's a broad uh, categorization, the decisions are completely different, right? You know. So some, of, some people have taken a very deficits-oriented approach and say, oh, well, maybe the African-Americans don't understand the numbers. Okay. You're at stage four, you are you know, five months, six months, eight months, you know, yeah. that's kind of uncertain information. But what we found in, in teaser data is it's not that they don't understand, but it is that the conversations they have yeah. and the decisions they made are very social. It's not at all individual, right? It is they're talking to their priests, they're talking to their family, and then making those decisions. So in that context, I'm just curious, and it builds on what Sarah was saying, how do we you know, communicate risk, you know? Uh, I mean, our uncertain information at the end of life. And I think this is an important research program. I don't think there is a lot in this area. I just want your thoughts or comments on this. But is the question about whether communicating risk is different in people who are making more socially oriented decisions rather than individualistic? Is that the uh, question? Uh, the social context and the uh, cultural context. Yeah, yeah. Think, you know, so. yeah I mean, physicians don't take that into account, right? Yeah, we don't get into medical school based on social and emotional intelligence. <laughs> to that. Um, I didn't say that. You said that. I did say that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you think about how, I mean, I definitely think we, we push too hard to make this all about the cognition and the understanding when that's such a small part. And you think about a, let's say a, anybody low income, whether they're black or white, coming into the elite hospital at end of life and they really haven't had much given to them their whole lives by the world and the doctor's wondering whether they, they want to make mom DNR. Um, that is a very different conversation. Right? And I think if you don't understand the social context of why they're gonna, wait, wait a second, you're telling me you don't wanna give something to my mom? What is that? Is that because of our, what we look like? What, you know, and, and you're not gonna get anywhere just by giving them the risks and benefits of resuscitation. Yeah, I think you have to be aware. Okay, uh, the next question will come from uh, Professor Brendan Nyan. So um, I have, a, I have a, qu a question related to Sarah's, which is about um, the shared decision-making approach, broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I'm trying to think about is how we can modulate, how we use that kind of an approach more generally. Right? So we're trying to get physicians to think about patient preferences more generally. Yeah. But there's this concern I have, and I wonder, you're the physician, so you can tell me if this is real, about that decision bleeding over into areas where the medical evidence is quite stronger about, about what the appropriate treatment is. So the reason we're using decision aids in yeah. a lot of these cancer contexts is because we're, we're over-screening and over-treating. And it's helping patients, and the, the medical benefits aren't always clear, right, of, of, of treatment. Or at least you could go different ways on what the appropriate treatment is in a lot of these mm -hmm. clinical scenarios, right? 
But I, I had an experience where we took my son to get, uh, to, to meet our pediatrician when he was born in Chapel Hill at a UNC affiliated pediatric clinic. And they started trying to do a kind of almost shared decision making model with us about vaccines. And the cue that gives us, going back to Dan's presentation was, this is something about which people have different preferences and like we're kind of not sure what the right decision is. We're gonna help you figure that out. They literally said, we're, we're willing to work with you on vaccine. And we were like, no, we want all of them, right? But someone else might not have said that. They might have said, wow, this pediatrician is opening with that. And so the concern I have is, and I, and I don't know if this is a real one or not, is that that mindset, we have to kind of modulate based on how strong the clinical evidence is. Yes. And, and, and I wonder how well we're able to do that at let me make two, let me, there's two times where I think you'll push more towards a shared decision-making model. Um, one is if you did a rigorous decision analysis of someone's alternatives and the utility values that people placed on outcomes, if, they, if you put them over a reasonable range, it would tip towards one versus another. So that, that would be the just mathematical way of saying this is a preference-sensitive decision. The, what people think about the outcomes, which can vary from one person to another, will change which treatment is best for them. And that's, I think that has been early on where a lot of the decision aids were made were where they had that evidence. The, this, and it could be that you have really good information on what the outcomes are. But it's just that different treatments have different outcomes and some people care about sex and some people don't care about sex. Um, the second thing is when there's just, it's weak evidence. And there's a lot of times in the medical literature now where they say, and so since we don't know what to do, that's something that you should work on and decide with your patient. And I don't know what to do with that. I mean, if we yeah. as a medical community can't do it, I can't imagine in, a, in an efficient clinic visit that I can bring them up to speed and then they somehow bring that last bit of, ah, then for you, vaccines mm -hmm. are good, vaccines are bad. So um, I'm more dubious of that. Um, but that's not, mo neither of those two categories are most medical decisions. There's all kinds of time where you're not in shared decision-making mode, you're in persuasion mode. And or you're helping people understand why the best thing for them to do is something rather than something else. Um, and it's because no reasonable person, and we can all debate what that threshold is, but no reasonable person is going to not have that fracture put into a cast. Right. The example I use is that, you know, wheel, they wheel you into the ER and they're like, Here's the decision about whether we should take the gunshot, you know, the bullet out of your right. abdomen, right? Right, and so nobody's They're doing like, that. do we have your consent? You know, we still want your consent. You still have autonomy as a patation, but we strongly recommend that this bullet be taken out of your body. They don't even right. usually do that. <laughs> no, I mean, they're, you're off. They yeah, didn't when I had that. Huh? They didn't want to have it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, this question goes to you. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, my name is Gabriel Hart from uh, Designer, and... I, you know, the first, you started with the different steps, and I see... You know, step one is oftentimes using plain language, and you see that repeated over and over and over again. It's a you know, it's sort of a mantra in a lot of uh, health, health and communications rubrics. I guess what's what's the difference between um, plain language and memorable and meaningful language, if if any, and memorable, memorable and or meaningful language, if any. Probably harder to remember something that wasn't plain, or to draw meaning from something that's not plain. So I think that might be that it's necessary but not sufficient for it, right? I could have something that's very plain language and is neither memorable nor meaningful, but I think when you put it in rich language that nobody can comprehend, it loses those two things. Yeah. On this point, yeah, on this point, I've been watching the news coverage of what's going on in the UK, and I think that the advocates of staying in the EU are making a huge mistake by using the term Brexit. Yeah. It would be much better for them to use a term that makes it seem like it will be awfully confusing and, and sort of catastrophic if we leave the EU. But Brexit just makes it sound so simple, right? So I think it's a memo should be sent to them. Uh, Professor Radescu. So I wanted to make a comment and maybe ask a question in the context of uh, this issue that came up several times that even if people understand sometimes their number, they do not make decisions that are uh, consistent with the number because of a variety of other factors. So in you know, behavioral decision theory, this can all be uh, captured by the probability weighting function, which is ex that's exactly what it does. It translates the plain probabilities into the weights that this probability carries into the context of the decision. And there's work that shows that probability weighting function is affected both by cognitive and by emotional factors. 
And I'm curious to what degree there's work in medical decision making as to how probability decision weighting is affected by these kind of things and whether people can kind of put priorities. You know, you know, people who are cancer care much, much more about the emotional rather than the cognitive and things of that type. So uh, it's, a, it's a question. Yeah. Um, I'm not aware of a ton of literature, but I'm really good at not being aware of literature. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm not sure how I, I have a hard time distinguishing cognitive and, and emotional a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know how you divide that up. I think these things happen so much together. Well, they're easier to distinguish when you run lab, labor, laboratory experiments mm -hmm. than, of course, yeah, but, yeah. But if you think of the work by Chris Shi and Yuval Rodin, for yeah. example, it's very, very clear how they distinguish between the two factors in laboratory experiments, right? I want to ask the, the last question of this session and just to bring some things together. When we put this day together, we were trying to think of speakers who could really make a, a powerful difference on issues like this, but we're coming at it from really different perspectives. So I want to think about, we've talked about things we could export to people in the audience, but I want to think about an import. You mentioned as one of your examples the I'm a surgeon line, right? So the idea I'm a surgeon, I, so I prefer surgery. There are actually a lot of people in the center who do these experiments where you vary the identity of a speaker and or vary the message that they're doing. Is there a literature that you know of on the, uh, whether a surgeon identifies as a surgeon before they give the advice? Because is, is there a literature on that, like an experimental literature, randomized control trial where A doesn't say, I'm a surgeon, I prefer surgery, and per, uh, person B does? Not that particular. I mean, again, the, the goal of having somebody, I mean, when someone's a physician, they're advice is weighed very differently than when they're not. And when they're positioned with the relevant specialty background that matters, I mean, that people come looking for that kind of expertise. So yeah. I, I'm just trying to think experimentally how you're having some random guy or gal just give advice and not yeah. divulge that they're a surgeon. And I'm not sure what, well, there was but, the, you know, So there was, the, um, there was the example where you could have surgery or the, it was towards the end of your presentation. You have surgery or other types of treatment. Yeah. And so you described a narrative where it's like, well, I'm a surgeon, I have a bias in favor of surgery. So I just wonder you know, if that segment, so the person could be a surgeon in both the control and treatment group, but in one group they sort of lay the identity, they put the identity in the room, and the other one they don't. Yeah, don't know of research like that. I think it would be, I think, you know, when people receive information, um, so different context, you know, you're trying to decide whether to let someone out on parole, and you've you hear all this information about why they should or shouldn't be let out on parole, and you find out that their name is Hernandez. Yeah. Are you going to be oh. racist? Well, it turns out Hernandez and Jones might be judged the same way. But if the first thing you heard was the names Hernandez and Jones, you filter all the subsequent information through that, and now you have a different parole judgment. And so I think the same would happen when I'm taking information, and I think it's a surgeon or a radiation oncologist or a primary care doctor. I'm probably thinking, oh, well, they have their own perspective. Yeah, so that's interesting because I think there are a lot of people in the room and probably online who are familiar with the paradigm of the message identity pairing and perhaps they could help you. So uh, thank you, Professor Rubel, and all the questions. Uh, folks.